Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We want to continue our study from the book of Job. Today, Job chapter 3. Let me ask, what do you do when a fellow believer is suffering? How do you deal with the situation? Many of us want to help, but we do not know what to do. We do not know what to say, how to say it, and even how to pray. Now, what if the person begins to say things you do not expect to hear? Words of doubt, discouragement, despair, defeat, and even words of dismay. Or what if the struggling person is you and I? Is it okay to feel like this? Last week, we talked about Job's faith. Today, in chapter 3, we're going to look at Job's feelings. Job is an obvious place to turn to when one is overwhelmed with pain and suffering. But it is too easy for a casual reader to leave this book more mystified than minister to. In fact, Job is an easy candidate for the Old Testament's most difficult book. For all its challenges, however, I believe the book of Job speaks directly to all of us, you and I, especially those who are suffering today. So let's talk about the book itself first. The book of Job is one of the oldest stories recorded in the Bible and may well be the oldest writing in the Old Testament. Why? Now, the words that were used are pretty ancient compared to all the other Old Testament books. If there is a difference in spelling a word, Job consistently uses the oldest form of the language. Now, also, this book uses shorthand for words that only appear in this book. Also, the religious customs of Job's time. Job offered sacrifices by himself, for himself and his family. There is no mention of tabernacle, temple, or even the priesthood, and definitely no mention of the Abrahamic covenant. It lacks references to the historical events and reflects a non-Hebrew culture background in this book. Very likely, this book predates Moses. Chronologically, the Old Testament books should be arranged as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But if Job is the oldest book and also recording one of the oldest characters in the Old Testament, then... Chronologically, it should be arranged this way, Genesis, and then Job, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, the book of Genesis covers the beginning of time, the beginning of everything. But Job covers the beginning of pain and sufferings in this world. Interestingly, this very first book written, possibly the oldest book in the Old Testament, here giving us a talk in regards to human suffering. Perhaps God knows what we needed the most, isn't it? And yet, in my opinion, the book of Job is greatly neglected and underused in our church today. Now, as we come to Job chapter 3, we see Job's spiritual as well as his emotional turmoils, pain, and subsequently raises the difficult questions about whether or not Job sinned. The more intensely Job seeks an answer to his questions, his pain, the more and more he realizes that there is a big gap between man's understanding and God's way. By focusing so intently on the why God, Job begins to lose the proper perspective he had earlier that we studied last week. In this chapter, chapter 3, Job opens his heart and he tells us how he feels. And Job's friends, who live from a distance, arrived, they came to be with him, to comfort him. Now, Job may have lost a lot of things. He has lost his children. And yet, when we come to this chapter, we realize that Job did not lose everything, or at least not everyone. He still have with him his friends, his three friends and also his wife. Now, for the very first time, in the first seven days when Job's friends arrived, they only sat with him and sat with him quietly. None of them 
said a word. Job himself was very quiet. Then the silence ends with an outpouring of grief. It is a cry of anguish from Job's heart. And some have referred to chapter 3 as Job's Gethsemane. It is a dark chapter of intense lamentation. Now, the literary feature of the book of Job from this point onwards in chapter 3 is that the speaker's turns to poetry. It was prose in the first two chapters that took place in heaven and earth. Then when you reach the last 10 verses of the book, you again meet peaceful prose. This is at the end of chapter 42 of the book. The Old Testament in a poetic form is not unique to Job. The writing prophets generally prophesy in poetry. If you have read the minor prophets and the major prophets in the Old Testament, while the history books are written in prose, the significance of poetry is that there is a deliberate choice of words and phrases constructed in a certain way to give the vividness. It is intended to be descriptive in regards to what is being said. And here, the author of the book of Job, as we venture into his feelings and the whole process of how men go through pains and sufferings, the questions that we ask both in our head and our heart, the author switched to, turn to poetic writings and including God's speech to Job and his three friends also in poetic form. Now, there is nothing left for Job in chapter 3 except to lament except his tears and his cries. He refuses to incriminate, incriminate himself falsely, and he refuses to blame God. But he does not hesitate to exp express his anguish, his feelings. He's not trying to suppress his feelings. And I think this is a very important fact. As much as we turn to God in faith and we practice faith and we hold on to our faith, looking to God, fixing our eyes to Him. I think it is all right to be human. It is all right to be feeling sad. It is all right to be feeling in despair, to be lamenting, crying and weeping and mourning, just like Job here. Now, there are three main features of Job's lamentation. He laments concerning his birthday and then his desire for death, and finally, his complaint against God. Notice that Job's lament is almost entirely in the form of questions when you read this chapter. The cause of his suffering is a mystery. Indeed, it may be the greatest mystery of faith. Why does God allow people he loves to suffer? Now, commonly, there are two explanations for suffering. Sin on our part, or God's work for growing us. Now, both are thoroughly and completely biblical. Neither of this valid explanation is, however, relevant to Job. It doesn't apply to Job in this book or in this story because God commanded that Job, in chapter 1, verse 8, there is no one on earth like Job. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Now, not even Satan, the accuser, can find fault with Job. My friends, this man is perfect. Job does not know the answer for his suffering. So the most honest thing he can do is to ask questions. Makes sense, isn't it? So Job chapter 3 verse 1. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He cursed the day of his birth. The first thing that Job did was to not curse God, but to curse that day when he was born. That day should be characterized by happiness and wonderful joy by all of those around him. On that occasion, a shout should go out from a house that a child has been born, but not now for Job. As he contemplates, reflects on his own day of birth, that day was a trigger for a lifelong sequence of events whose aim was comprehensive disaster, pain, torture, 
and unimaginable grief, not only for him, his wife, and his loved ones. What is so strange for us to understand is that the man who is cursing the day of his birth is not cursing the God who formed him in his mother's womb and gave him his first breath. Job does not believe that anything can be done about the day of his birth, but he is simply saying, from what has happened to me, it might just as well have been that a great curse fell upon me when I was born and my life. See it today, it's a result of the curse of my birth. Now, secondly, in verse 11 of Job chapter 3, he said, Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire? Job desired death. Job wishes that he had been a stillborn child. The pain that he is going through is so intense and immense that he would not wish it on anyone, even his own enemy. He said, better for a person suffering as I am to have died at birth. So in verse 11, he says, why did I not perish at birth or die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? And again in verse 16, he said, why was I not hidden in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? He thinks of the deliverance from a life of pain and suffering that a stillborn child knows. Job is setting out to understand both of himself and of God here. And finally, in chapter 3, verse 25, he said, For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and I dread before befalls me. Job complained against God. This is what he feared most all along, that even in the good days, you remember every morning Job prayed for his children, his family, that they may not sin against God and that God would forgive them. Job had been made aware that the things he feared most may happen to him in those days, every morning when he prayed. In other words, Job often thought about his 10 children, about how much he loved them and what would happen if one of them would die or something bad happens to them. He thought about his wife and how much he depended on her and he thought to himself, how could I ever cope if she turned against me? He thought about his wealth. He thought about his friends. He thought about all the things that he had and God has blessed him with and he's enjoying it. And he wants to enjoy it responsibly. Therefore, he prayed each morning, not taking for granted God's blessings and his protection. Job would wake up in the night and he would think of all these things that were precious and important to him. How awful it would be if he lost them and lost everything. And then he would pray for them and seek God's blessing and protection. And guess what, friends? Then all things, everything happened. The things that he feared the most all happened and happened on the same day, at the same time. Now, every Christian thinks like that. There is not a single one of us who has not thought of the things we most dread or we most fear of happening to us and our loved ones. How would we cope if these things happen to us? How would our faith survive? How could we still exercise or practice faith in God? And what would we say or pray to God? You see, friends, let me pause for a moment. And I want to explain this to us. You see, Satan has got only limited power. Satan can harm us, but he cannot hurt us. Because ultimately, in this book, Job, we learn that God is in control and God will protect us. He may allow bad things to happen to us, his children. And yet in this story, we see that God kept Job. And in that same way, God will keep us. In fact, the Holy Spirit will, will enable us, will give us that strength that we need at that point in time. We need not live in fear or pray in fear. 
We live by faith. And when we pray for our children, our loved ones, we pray for ourselves. We pray with faith. And by faith, we believe that God will do what is best. Just as Job, he said these words, Though God slay me, yet will I trust Him. That level of faith, not fear at all. I'm encouraged by Paul's word. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That, that is powerful. Words of faith. And then when we come to verse 26 of chapter 3, he finalized his complaint. He summarized his complaint where his life is declared to be the exact opposite of how he imagines. He concludes in the last verse with these comforting words. Verse 26, I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. Now, this phrase has been such a comfort to believers passing through suffering who have felt exactly like what Job said. And they're not afraid to say it. This shows how God tolerates such a sense of despair, the intensity of our feelings, and sometimes even a sense of negativity in our feelings when we go through pain spiritual turmoils. This is no mark that we are not a believer. These are the things that Job says in this psalm of lament. He curses the day of his birth, and then he wishes that he had been stillborn and buried as a little child, and then he complains against God. Job thinks that the grave is a better place. Why is it that Death seems such an attractive relocation for some people when they go through pain and sufferings. Well, for Job, it is a place of rest and sleep, free from all the pains, the concerns, and the burdens of this world. Now, notice though, Job never contemplates taking his own life. Suicide is not an option for him. Yet even as Job laments and lays his complaint out. There is a recognition that God is present in his circumstances and that his life is still in the hand of God. And it is not his call to decide when he will die. He willingly submit that to God, knowing that God still have a purpose. But then the most important part, my friends, there is nothing wrong to be feeling the way we feel when we go through pain and suffering, just as Job demonstrated to us. So coming back to our first question as we began this message, what do you say, what will you do for someone, a fellow believer, when they go through pain and suffering? So what would you say to Job? Two things to immediately remember. First, the greatest pain in times of suffering is not only physical, emotional and mental, but also spiritual. Job speaks of a man whose way is hidden in verse 23. Now, this could either mean hidden from God or hidden from himself. Hidden from God simply means to be disconnected from God, to feel like God's presence is not there with you. And because God doesn't seem to care anymore, God seems to be absent, distant, and unconcerned. Or, It could also mean hidden from himself. And this is where he lost touch with all his previous experiences, all that he knew and all that he was before. Now, this is where the essence of a believer's life or his walk with God, it is a walk of faith. It is by faith, not by sight. It is not about how we feel, but it is a commitment a deliberation that we choose to still have faith in God. Now, is finding God's will for everything a biblical idea? I ask this question because Job did not know what happened in chapter 1 and 2. And he did not know about that incident, God's conversation with Satan, throughout the book and even after he recovered. Now, Therefore, the question, you know, most of us, uh, you know, we felt like we need to know the will of God in everything and in every situation. 
Now, but this book teaches us the opposite. You see, God has a plan. And sometimes He does not intend for us to find it or to know it. Now, you know, He wants us to live by faith. He wants us to act in faith. Just because God has a plan does not mean that He necessarily has any intention of sharing it with us or revealing it to us. There are many things in our lives that we understand, but there are a lot more things that we will never understand. And I think this is something that we must learn to accept it, embrace it, and begin to live in this manner. The message of Job is in part that God in His sovereignty may allow bad things to happen. And we may never know why, none of us. The events of the first two chapters were never disclosed to Job. But what we do know is this, that it is only through the hiddenness, through the afflictions that our faith is tested and proven. The very fact that we have light and life is the proof that God has not finished with us yet, that we should continue by faith. And finally, the second, is to remember that God's verdict of Job. What did God say concerning Job? In chapter 1, verse 8, He said, My servant Job. And then again, in chapter 42, later on you're going to see, when He tells His friends, For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. 42, verse 8. Job's outpouring is not counted as sin or an offense to God. In fact, Job's salvation was never in doubt. God entertained. God walked through and walked with Job. With his emotions, his feelings as he wrestled through this. So how do we respond to Job? Next week, we will explore the words and help from his so-called friends and counselors, his comforters. But what about you? What would you say to Job? after his outburst of feelings, or to a friend who is going through pain and much pain and sufferings? Well, for now, perhaps the best response is what the book of Romans tells us, weep with those who weep. To be there for them, to be there with them, to be there to comfort them, not with your words, but with your presence, to be there simply. Even God's answer is 35 chapters away yet in this story. We're only in chapter 3. And pray for those we know who may be going through pain. Never to be too quick to judge, not, never to be too quick to give us solutions because most of them are not looking for solutions. They simply want someone to come along and to share that emotions, that burden, their feelings with them. Today, I want to close with this prayer for those who are going through pain and sufferings. It could be sickness, it could be a marriage, it could be your finances. I want to pray and I want to comfort you that we are here with you as a spiritual community, that the Holy Spirit, the greatest comforter, will be with you in that room. Heavenly Father, we stand with those who are in pain, those who are weeping today. They are not alone that today we come to be with them. Today, this message, I pray, will comfort them, will give them perspective. Lord, as they continue to exercise faith in you, Father, I pray that they will feel safe to pour out their emotions, their feelings to you and to those around them, that it is perfectly okay to cry, perfectly all right to even complain against God. Would you do the work of healing as you promise that you are near to those who are brokenhearted, that you're with them in Jesus' name. Amen.
even in the darkest night, even in the darkest hour, I believe, I believe, I believe that you are good, even in the darkest night, even in the darkest hour, I believe, I believe, I believe that you are good, even in the darkest even in the darkest hours, I believe, I believe, I believe that you are good. Even in the darkest night, even in the darkest hours, I believe, I believe, I believe that you are good. Even in the darkest night, even in the darkest Towers. I believe, I believe, I believe that you are good. Even in the darkest night, even in the darkest hours, I believe, I believe, I believe that you are You are